a little while ago, you lent me this book. And for those of you who are listening and have not had a chance to read this book, I suggest you do so because there's a number of interesting things in there. Some things I already knew, but other things that I did not know. We like interesting things. I've had this book on my bookshelf for years, actually, and I knew that it was something that you would appreciate, which is why I took it down off my bookshelf and gave it to you, and we got a podcast out of it. At least one. At least one. There might be more stuff in there that we can look into. But what stuck out to me the most in this book, which is called 50 Things You're Not Supposed to Know, was this piece that he wrote on Freud. Freud is a weird dude. He, that that's like saying that McDonald's is a small hamburger stand. <laughs> I think you're not putting in perspective how insane this man was. Yeah, yeah. Well, by the time you're done listening to this podcast, you'll have a better idea. The guy was loony as a tune. Oh, most definitely. I had studied his stuff before. I don't think I've talked about it before, but I have some degrees in things. Oh, yeah? What degrees do you have? I have a degree in behavioral science. What? I have a degree in physical science, and I also have a degree in business finance, minor in economics. You're a a man of letters. Yes. A learned fellow. But I even actually don't you... write a lot of letters. People don't write letters anymore. <laughs> I'm a man of emails. <laughs> You're a dork. But even you didn't know what a wingnut, even with all of your degrees. Well, we had studied degree. Freud because when I was doing right. the behavioral science, of course, you study Freud and all his theories because he is the foundation of modern psychiatry. The cracked, incorrect foundation. Yeah. Once you whittle away a lot of the wingnut, some of the ideas have some validity to them, but you don't really learn much about the history and where they came from. I brought it up to you. I said, hey, what do you think about doing a whole podcast episode on Sigmund Freud? And I said, hell to the yes. Because I know you've always found the man interesting. Yes. So for your listening pleasure... We are proud to present Freudian Slip, the working title for this podcast. (laughs) I love it. (laughs) That's not the working title. That is the title. Uh, For for now, we have the right to change it. That's pretty good. Okay, I like it. Uh, The thing about him is that there are so many Can the graphic please be Freud wearing a slip? I'll see what I can do. Do God, Tim, you come just on. throw out these challenges. I do. Yeah, I did. You all like right. challenges. All right, all right. I'll okay. see what I can do. Freudian slip. It's My his Photoshop mug magic on a on a yeah stock photo of someone wearing a slip. Okay. Well, we'll see. I'll, I'll, I'll and, see and clutching a that. cigar in one hand. Well, I was thinking about if I can find a, a picture of him holding a cigar, and he was constantly chain smoking. He had a lifelong addiction to cigarettes. Which really helped the oral cancer. Yeah. Which we're not even going to get into. There's so much much, stuff. So much. We didn't even know where to start. And we will have an after hours podcast because there's a lot of research that went into this. And things that we just had to jettison because we didn't want to make this a three hour podcast. I was thinking if I could find a picture of him holding a cigarette, I would probably Photoshop out the cigarette and just put a dick. (laughs) <laughs> because sometimes right. a cigar is, is more than just a cigar. It's more than just a cigar, right. <laughs> Are we ready to jump right into I'm, it? I'm so ready. I'm ready. Okay, before we get into it, the housekeeping business, if you want to call in for any reason and leave us a message, give us feedback, have an idea for something you want us to explore, and research and present as a podcast, you can do so by giving us a call at 614-733-4739, also known as 614-R-DeGrey. That is 614-R-D-E-G-R-E-Y. That's right. Let's get ready to get some psychological nasty. I'm rolling up my sleeves and I'm ready to dive in.
Before we jump into the wackadoodle weird mess that is Sigmund Freud, I wanted to give you a little quiz on some of his basic ideas on things. See how much you know and how much our listeners know about this man that is the foundation of modern psychiatry and psychoanalysis. That seems like a plan. There are three things that he theorizes make up our personality. Do you know what those three things are? Uh, Id, ego, and superego. Right, okay. What do you know about the id? Fucking nothing. It's one of the three things. The id is your unconscious. The id demands immediate gratification and controls all your needs. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. I'd heard that. All right, do go on. Essentially, babies are nothing but pure id because you operate completely in the moment, are looking for immediate response to all your needs. If everybody was living in pure id all the time, we would essentially just be sleeping, fucking, eating, and binge-watching shows and video games. It would be anarchy and chaos. People would be getting drunk, fighting, fucking, yeah. Yeah. It's, that's that base, primal, animal instinct of pleasure and immediate gratification. Yes. Okay. Ego. That's different than the id. Yes. In what way? It's... Well, I guess, the, okay, so if id's the base, mm-hmm. then superego... If it's on a uh, scaling spectrum, then I guess ego's in the middle. Yeah. It's less animalistic and more more evolved, more self-control. I don't... Okay, yeah, it's a little bit more self-control. It is in the middle. It's in the middle, right, right. So the ego develops to mediate between the unrealistic id and the external real world. So as you grow and develop, you realize... I can't have my immediate gratification at all times. So this ego starts developing in that way. The ego operates according to the reality principle, as Freud puts it, working out realistic ways of satisfying the id's demands, but making compromise and postponing satisfaction to avoid negative consequences of society. Because the child learns by punishment through the parents, if you do this thing, you're not going to get your demands met and you're also going to get this negative reward. Okay, that makes sense. Part of being a kid is having to learn that you don't always get everything you want immediately. It's a terrible, hard lesson to learn. It is, and they're very resistant to it and they fight it tooth and nail. And literally part of being a parent is breaking in your child and is reining back those deep animalistic primal instincts they have. It is a lot like domesticating some sort of wild animal. Yes. Final part, the superego. That's the most evolved part of your psyche? Basically, its function is to control the id's impulses, much like the ego, but it especially controls those impulses that society forbids, such as sex and aggression. So the id is your unconscious, your base animal desire, Your ego is aware of what society demands of you. And your ego is basically saying, I want to get my needs met. I don't want to get punished. And your super ego is the societal learning that's sitting on top of all that, that says, here's what you need to do so you can get your needs met and not get punished. What's the difference between the ego and the super ego again? Those seem kind of similar the ego is more base fear so it does control the i thought the id was the base fear no no id is base need base need ego is controls the id out of base fear and it's the reality of the world being like if i do this i know i'm gonna get this punishment super ego is more the intellectual here's how i can satisfy both my needs of the id and the ego. Okay. So the, the superego is the last one to develop. It develops around the age of three or five during the phallic stage of psychosexual development. Now, each one of these id, ego, and superego 
traits of your personality are all linked to three stages of early childhood development, which we'll get into. I know them. Okay. Before we get into that, a little background on this. So Freud stressed that the first five years of life are crucial to the formation of adult personalities. The id must be controlled in order to satisfy social demands. This sets up a conflict between frustrated wishes and social norms. Like I said, we can't all just be sitting around gluttonously eating buckets of fried chicken while streaming Netflix and constantly masturbating. Why not? That sounds amazing. Except for the fried chicken for you. I, but in principle, I get it. Yes. Masturbating Netflix and buckets of fried chicken. Because nothing would ever get done oh. and social norms would prevent you from doing this because you would kind of be ostracized. Yes, social norms really affect me. I'm terrified of being ostracized. Hmm. Each of the psychosexual stages that we're about to discuss is associated with a particular conflict that must be resolved before the individual can successfully advance to the next stage. So it's kind of like going through a video game. You have to beat the boss before you can progress in your social, sexual, psycho development. Okay. Now, Freud sexualized things a lot. No. Yeah. Shocked face. Essentially, he thought that the id was purely controlled by libido. Kids are inherently sexual and everything is to get this sexual need met. So let's talk about the initial three stages as he put them. Oh, I know they're oral, anal, and genital, but I don't... Oral, anal, and phallic. Oh, gen- phallic, yeah. genital. Well, like, phallic okay. because he was all about the dick. It's not all about the dick, According Freud. to Freud, it's all about the dick. All right, or... <laughs> Oral, anal, and phallic mm-hmm. it's, it's genital. It's stupid. All right. Which stage would you say comes first? Uh, oral. Yep. The first stage of personality development, the libido. Again, this is a small child because this is from birth to one year. So, of course. Horny pants. These young one-year-old kids have a libido. <laughs> Just, uh... The libido is completely centered around the baby's mouth because their whole world is essentially things coming in and out of their mouth. And yeah. coming in and out of the... <sighs> well, it's going to be thread that needle carefully, my friend. Well, as he puts it, it babies get all the satisfaction from putting all sorts of things this is in true. its mouth to satisfy the libido Okay. and the id's demands because the id is pure hunger. And the okay. id is just unsatisfied, demanding hunger. At this stage in life, Everything is oral and mouth-oriented, if you can think about their sucking, their biting, and their breastfeeding. Freud said that oral stimulation could lead to an oral fixation in later life. So if people never resolved this oral stage, then they can wind up with personality traits such as being a smoker, a nail-biter, finger-chewers, thumb-suckers. I think it's interesting that Freud mentions smoking in these oral fixation habits because, as we alluded to before, he chain-smoked the hell out of his cigarettes the whole And it killed him. Yeah. One one thing I read about him was that he wouldn't go to bed until he had smoked his last cigarette. And he lived... I thought cigars was his thing. Well, there there were cigar cigarellos that he would constantly be smoking. He would go to the shop every day and get a certain number of cigars, or cigarettes, whatever you want to call them. They were larger than regular cigarettes. They were right. like a combination, you know, cigar- cigarellos, let's call them. Okay. He would stay up and chain smoke until the last one was gone. And that's when he was kind of forced to go to bed because he would have no more to smoke. Wow. Talk about an oral fixation. Yeah. Great quote, which goes along with this stage. Direct quote from Freud. No one who has seen a baby sinking back satisfied from the breast and falling asleep with flushed cheeks and a blissful smile can escape the reflection that this picture persists as a prototype of the expression 
of sexual satisfaction in later life. It's all about sex. I'm sorry, Freud. I've never looked at a baby falling asleep, having just breastfed and saying, oh, that kid looked like he just got off. <laughs> just wait, kid. It gets yeah, better. that's not. Yeah, dude. I Yeah, I would. A lot of this podcast is going to be showcasing how much he kept getting things wrong. Well, and how much he sexualized young children. Yeah. And there's a reason for that. Oh. Which we'll get to. Okay. Second stage. Anal. Yes. Ha ha ha. This stage is all about things coming out the butt. Well, once you put the things in the mouth, inevitably it's going to come out the butt. Anal stage usually goes from age one to about age three. This is when the child becomes incredibly fixated on their anus. And according to Freud, the child derives great pleasure from defecating. Do children get great I pleasure? Don't Have you? No. You raised a kid. I don't think so. it's Did she the really poop would just come out. Um, I don't know if it's because sometimes they play with their poop or they have no idea what's going on, but I don't think. I've ever looked at a kid pooping. Maybe it's because the look they get on their face, they get that weird faraway look. You can tell when a baby's pooping because they just, they stop and they get this glazed look. And they're like, oh shit, they're shitting. <laughs> because you Do know they have that a you're going to have to deal with it. Yeah, because they don't know. It's just this thing. Everything that happens to them is just something that happens. They're peeing. It's just their body reacting in this way that they have no control over at this moment. It's like your body's saying, you're going to shit right now. And baby's like, oh, I'm shitting right now. What's happening? <laughs> you're just this bag of experience and flesh. Right. Things are happening to you. People are carrying you, taking you here and there. You have no control over your life and reality at all. And you're just, if you can imagine walking down the street, you're like, oh, what's happening? Oh, I'm pooping. You just kind of like have to let go. In order for the poop to come out, you have to relax and just let it pass. This is the first time that adults impose restrictions on the child. And this is generally one of the biggest struggle with children is when you try to potty train them. As Freud puts it, the nature of of this first conflict with authority can determine the child's future relationship with all forms of authority. So depending on how hard you come down on your child with about their poop, that's how they're going to relate to authority from now until the rest of their life. So how does that factor in with you toilet training your daughter? We were pretty low key about it. Oh. I know a lot of parents try to make it a happy fun time. Okay. Maybe I should have been stricter with her on the potty training. I didn't know that that would have such a direct impact on their entire rest of the time on this planet. It doesn't. Well, according to Freud. According to Freud, but the guy was wrong about <laughs> so many things. I don't think that, I don't even remember potty training. You're so young. Do you remember getting potty trained? Nope. I don't, I'm sure there's people out there that remember getting potty trained. I could talk to my daughter and ask her, do you remember potty training? No. But obviously we've all been broken at some point or another. I mean, you do literally have to break them. I mean, you have to create a sense of shame and significance and urgency and control around the anus so they're not just <laughs> pooping all over Leaving the place. trails of shit everywhere so they go. So you are indeed breaking them in some way. It, it, I mean, it has to have some psychological impact where you have to get them to be aware of their anus, get them to have control over their anus, get them to be uh, under the impression that if they don't have control over the anus, that's bad. Um, even if you're trying to make it happy fun times, I mean, there is a certain breaking of the id that has to happen. Yeah. Freud's take on it, which is kind of strange because I'd never thought about it in this way. This potty training and the child's attachment to the anus is all related to the pleasure they get from holding on to their feces when toddlers and then their parents insisting that they get rid of it by placing them on the potty until they perform. It doesn't feel pleasurable to retain. It hurts. <laughs> like I'm you sitting want... here with my full I'm colon. Just keeping oh my God, this it feels so good. Who? I keep this poop in as long as I can. That's what he's, boy, wrong. My parent wrong. is demanding this poop from me, but wrong. I hold on to this poop. This poop is mine. You cannot take my poop from my wrong. cold, dead hands, Mom. <laughs> wrong. That's the anal phase. The last phase of this early childhood development, and there are two phases after this phase, but these are the big three that he talks about. 
the the other two phases are basically coming to terms with going through these three phases. That's why I'm not even going to talk about those other two phases. But the final of the three is... I believe it's genital, but it's fucking Freud, so it's it phallic. phallic. But yes. Yes, it's yes. not all about the dick, dude. According to him. Wrong. Also, these three phases are related to the id, the ego, and the superego, like we discussed before. So the oral stage is pure id, just pure satisfaction. The anal stage is the ego. You become aware of what society demands of you because the society wants your shit. No, it doesn't. Sit on that pot. Give me Wrong. that poop now. Wrong. And the phallic stage is when you start developing the superego because you start becoming aware of the consequences that could happen if you don't perform by society's rules. Society doesn't want your poop. <laughs> Nobody wants to deal with your shit. <laughs> Honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Fact. <laughs> the phallic stage is where things get really odd and interesting. This is where you start forming your sexual identity. Your attention now becomes incredibly concentrated on your genitals, and masturbation becomes a new source of pleasure. So, this is between age three and six. In boys, this is where the what complex comes into play the oedipus complex yes the oedipus complex and this is his idea of where your base understanding of social structure comes into play according to freud during this developmental stage the child develops a sexual attraction to his or her opposite sex parent and hostility toward the same sex parent so for boys they do want to fuck their mothers and kill their fathers. The big component of the Oedipus complex for boys is castration anxiety. This is the only way you can become moral in society. Freud believed that boys learn right from wrong as a result of a subconscious memories of witnessing father apes castrating their sons for even minor infractions. So he piggybacked off of some of Darwin's ideas that since we did come from apes, we have these innate base memories that if we do wrong, our fathers are going to castrate us in some way. So apes were running around and fathers were ripping off their son's dicks because the son did something wrong? And we carry that as a deep primal animalistic fear? Yes. I didn't even know that was a punishment that apes would I would think that that would be more likely that if the father was in charge of the pack he didn't want his son coming along and challenging him so he rips off his dick Possibly. he can stay in charge longer I think Freud might have misinterpreted that one a bit I don't even know if monkeys do this I didn't even research that That's the, weirdest the, the thing. apes were actually doing this Okay, but this is when boys develop their sense of morality out of fear of being castrated by their fathers did you ever have a fear that your father was going to castrate you? No. Freud, wrong. <laughs> wrong. But it's, so, it's, so it's also a literal castration fear, according to him, but it's also figuratively that you're basically shamed and emasculated, is, is, as he puts it. So that's the biggest part of this mm -hmm. castration anxiety as actually fearing the loss of your dick, because at this point, everything becomes dick-centric. The child then begins to fear their father because... He doesn't want to lose his dick, which is his most prized possession at this point. Is your dick your most prized possession? It's the jewels, right? No. That's why they call them the family jewels. Uh, men are particularly protective of their dicks. It does seem that guys are very protective and focused on their dick, and they do seem to attribute a lot of significance to it, and they're very focused on it, I've noticed. And as you've seen, they're very proud of it, and they're free oh. to send you pictures of it online. Oh, they're so proud of their dicks without ever being invited to do so. And it's and I hate to I hate to break it to them, but it the, the, all pretty much looks the same. 
but each guy, I'm sure you got some variations, circumcised, not circumcised, curves to the left, curves to the right, you know, a little girthier, a little shorter, a little longer, but in general, inside a bell curve, they're just kind of left sausages, but each guy's like, but this one, this one will get your attention, and it's, uh, they pretty much look the same. Hello, ladies. <laughs> My magic stick is more magical than all the others. Mm -hmm. During this phallic stage, the child now that is fixated on the mom and wants to possess the mother, but he understands that the father is superior in both size and strength, and the father could easily use these advantages to prevent the boy from possessing the mother. And the boy is also kind of jealous of the father because he has already had the mother. The boy is also afraid of a preemptive strike from the father. This is where the castration anxiety comes from because he's afraid of this preemptive strike from the father to take away the cause of the conflict, which is the boy's penis. And this is why he's afraid of the castration because I guess he theorized that the father, now that the boy is maturing, obviously wants to fuck the mom. The father's possessive of the mom and says, I'm going to take away this boy's dick so he does not try and fuck the mom. Wrong. Yes. So this castration anxiety drives the child to give up his sexual desire for his mother and redirect his attention to becoming more like the father because he has already had the mom. So he's saying, if I can't have the mom, then I want to be more like this guy that has been able to have this woman and he will show me how to become the type of man that can possess my ultimate object of desire. For girls, the Oedipus complex is a lot different. Since girls are lacking something. No, we're not. Well, girls have no protuberant genitalia to protect. whoop de doo So girls can never acquire morality because morality only comes from the fear of being castrated and losing your dick. I have protuberant breastuses that I would like to protect because they are delicate and they are easily injured and I don't want them hurt. But when you were six, you did not have these breasts. This is all between three and six years old. You didn't have breasts back then. All you realized is that you had a lack of a penis. I, well, I don't know that lack is the right word. When I, I had a sister, and there was just me and my sister, and I didn't see a lot of genitalia, and the first time that I ever saw boy genitalia, and I saw testicles, I bent over, according to my mother, observed the boy, frowned, looked up to my mother, and said, poo-poo, because I thought that he had poop hanging off of him, and I thought he needed to be cleaned up, because I'd never seen hanging testicles before and it didn't look right to me at all it wasn't an envy it wasn't like i want to have that i thought he had shit hanging off him and it needed to be cleaned mm -hmm. sorry freud i also had this experience with my daughter i was getting out of the shower one time and drying off and my daughter came into the bathroom looked at me and started laughing and i said what is it honey and she said and i quote daddy your giant is so silly <laughs> pointing and laughing because I guess to her, it was just a weird vagina. That was just dangling all over the place and not shaped right. It's just a silly vagina. Right. But according to Freud, since you have no penis, you have no castration anxiety, which develops your superego, which controls your ego and your id, because you realize there's going to be real social consequences if you don't perform to society standards, i.e. you're going to lose your dick. That's the only thing that keeps people in check. Since girls cannot acquire morality, they need guidance from fathers and later husbands. During this stage, Freud says they develop something called penis envy, but it's not a real thing and he's wrong again. It is penis envy, yes. <laughs> Young girls distance themselves from their mothers and instead devote their attention to their fathers. As Freud puts it, and I quote, Girls hold their mother responsible for their lack of a penis and do not forgive her for their being thus put at a disadvantage. 
wrong. So it's your mom's fault that you were born a woman and don't have a dick. Wrong. Freud essentially saw women as men without penises. And when a woman realizes that she does not possess a penis, she experiences an envy of the male, which accounted for much of female behavior because their lives were dominated by their sexual reproductive functions. He goes on to claim that the only way they could overcome this penis envy was to have a child of their own, even going so far as to suggest that they wanted a male child in an effort to gain a penis. Because once you can bear this male child, you have a penis vicariously of your very own. Wrong. I never had a kid, but if I'd had a kid, I 150% would have wanted a daughter. I would not have wanted a son. I'm sorry that you will never have a penis. I'm okay. I have all the penises I want. I have a vagina, which means I can get all of the penis. Well, you obviously have no morality, and I'm sorry that you never developed morality because you're not fear of being <laughs> castrated. <laughs> I don't have a lot of morality. Of course, during this stage, the girls become incredibly fixated on their father's penis. Yeah. Wrong. When she, when she realizes that she cannot have her father's penis, she wants babies. Men are predestined to become increasingly moral. Women are predestined to lie and connive in order to get a man to impregnate them and, of course, give them this moral guidance that they lack. Oh, yes, men are so moral and full of moral guidance. Yeah, no doubt. One of Freud's disciples, Helen Deutsch, built upon this idea and took it so far as to state that the young girl's lack of a penis meant she stopped identifying with her father, went on to develop fantasies of being raped. She believed that these rape fantasies were an integral part of female sexuality, and with this, the idea of a woman's personality being determined by her lack of a penis was strongly enforced in society. Wrong. Freud's concept of penis envy was criticized. What he saw as penis envy was that they were more envious of males' position in society. So he attributed it to like, oh, they obviously don't have a dick and they really want a dick and that's why they're crazy. No, they're crazy because society doesn't allow them to do anything. They have no rights. They have no pockets. They have no title. They're a property. It's not penis envy, but if you are a woman of that time and you're looking and you're like, I am a second-class citizen, I am chattel, I belong to my father, and then I am sold to my husband, I can't own property, I can't leave the house, I can't have any pockets, that's the envy, is looking at the privilege that men get and the privilege that comes with the penis. Not like, oh, I wish I had a penis, but oh, I wish I had the same amount of privilege. I wish I had pockets. And pockets. I wish I had pockets and privilege. It's not penises, but pockets we want. (laughs) One of Freud's contemporaries, a female analyst named Karen Horney, suggested that men are, in fact, adversely affected by their inability to bear children, which she referred to as womb envy. Freud, of course, responded to this by writing, We shall not be very greatly surprised if a woman analyst who has not been sufficiently convinced of the intensity of her own wish for a penis also fails to attach proper importance to the factor in her patience. He was so fixated on cock. Yes, he was. This leads us to our final discussion on some of Freud's theories. His seduction theory. Which is? Prior to Freud sexualizing all children in this strange perverse way, he had a much different theory which accounted for the problems of hysteria and the obsessive neurosis that he saw in his patients. After a number of his patients 
told him of these repressed memories of sexual abuse as children. He was one of the only analysts at this time to believe that these claims were indeed real and not just made-up fantasies. Most of his colleagues thought that their claims were these pathological fantasies. However, he abandoned this theory. He changed his mind, saying these things hadn't happened, but were instead subconscious adolescent sexual desires and rape fantasies. So originally he said, okay, I think I have this. These people were sexually abused when they were kids, but oh wait, never mind. They're obviously lying. Kids are just sexual beings, and these are these fantasies that they have related to wanting penises and having sex with their fathers and their mothers and all this stuff. People aren't really sure why he changed his mind in this way. There are some theories that it was because he succumbed to the pressure from his colleagues saying, no, this wasn't happening in Victorian times. People were not being sexually abused. Or that sexual abuse was rampant in society and that because of this, no one would actually listen to his theories that people were being systematically sexually abused. Also, some of his friends were suspected abusers, like Wilhelm Fleiss, who I believe you're going to talk about later on, who it was assumed might have been molesting his own son. And others believe that it was because Freud had the revelation that he himself had been sexually abused by his father at a young age and didn't want to admit it. Whatever the reason, he unfortunately changed his mind and it meant this huge delay in really looking at what sexual abuse does to people. He could have been at the forefront of this a hundred years ago, but yet he dropped the ball and he could be remembered as a great revolutionary in that way. But he said, oh wait, never mind. It's just because the children are sexual and they want to fuck their parents. Thanks, Freud. <laughs> Because that's easier than addressing the sexual abuse that's happening all around you. Yep. Previously on Dirty Talk After, After hours. hours. Yeah, you ready for this final volley? I'm ready. All right, let's, let's do, do it. All right, hunker down. Oh, shit. It looks like they're regrouping. Ah! What are they doing over there? Oh, crap. Oh, it's, it's coming. coming! Ah! After Hours, available exclusively on Patreon every Monday morning. If you do want to get access to the Dirty Talk After Hours podcast, you can get it in one of two ways. You can follow Rain DeGray on Patreon at patreon.com backslash Rain DeGray. You have to type it out exactly. I'm not searchable because I'm naughty. She has been blacklisted. She's in the adult ghetto. I'm a bad, bad girl. Or you can head on over to our brand spanking new shiny Dirty Talk podcast Patreon, which is patreon.com backslash Dirty Talk podcast. 
Either way, if you pledge at $5 a month, you will get exclusive weekly access to the Dirty Talk After Hours podcast. An overarching theme you're going to notice for this entire podcast is me continuing to say just how frequently Freud was wrong. And I'm going to bring an example to the table of just how wrong Freud was. And my example is called The Princess and the Pussy. Freud was many things. Trendsetter, a lover of cocaine, a passionate man who believed strongly in his convictions, and someone who tended to be very wrong about many things. Among the many things that he got wrong was the belief that women are all running around resentfully wishing they had dicks like we just discussed, Mm -hmm. and that any female orgasm that was not vaginally based was not a true orgasm. The era that Freud grew up in was dominated by these long-standing beliefs that female sexuality should only be about the vagina and nothing else, along with fears over masturbation and overt female sexuality. In 1905, Freud came up with the theory that clitoral stimulation and masturbation were immature, and that any woman that was interested in anything other than vaginal penetration needed psychological help. He was wrong. I'm just going to keep saying that for this whole podcast. He was wrong. He theorized that women's capacity to experience orgasm during intercourse varied according to their psychoanalytic development. In his view, girls initially experienced clitoral eroticism that was similar to boys' penal eroticism. As girls matured, they transitioned from clitoral eroticism to vaginal eroticism, which allowed them to experience orgasm during vaginal intercourse. In Freud's view, orgasm from vaginal intercourse reflected mature, psychologically healthy mindset where continued reliance on clitoral arousal for orgasm reflected psychologically immature development. This unfortunate belief no doubt led to many women never getting to experience orgasms at all, and in one case led directly to unnecessary surgery on Princess Pussy. You go on. Princess Marie Bonaparte, Princess of Greece and Denmark, great grandniece of Napoleon, heir to the fortune of Monte Carlo, and aunt to Britain's Prince Philip, was a French author as well as being one of the first female psychoanalysts. Her mother died shortly after she was born complications around the birth, and her father was a very distant and disengaged parent who mainly let her grandmother raise her. She grew up very intelligent, yet extremely lonely and pretty neurotic. She was a hypochondriac, and she was burdened by phobias. She was also very unusual, and between the ages of seven and a half and ten, she filled five separate notebooks with stories that discussed her miseries and the origins of her neurotic symptoms. Not a lot of kids between the ages of seven and a half and ten are sitting down with themselves and filling out five separate notebooks discussing their neurotic symptoms and their thoughts and feelings. Kids get easily distracted. The fact that she had the traction to keep that up is definitely noticeable. I know a lot of seven, eight, nine, ten-year-olds, and they don't have that level of focus. These notebooks later played an important part in her own analysis, and eventually they were published with her own commentaries as well as those of Freud. She ended up marrying Prince George of Greece, and the marriage lasted until his death in 1957, but it was an emotionally unfulfilling marriage, complicated by the fact that her husband was desperately in love with his uncle. Mm -hmm. Fact. He would actually drag his wife 
for him to come moon over his uncle and both his wife and his uncle's wife could tell that the uncle and nephew were deeply in love with each other, but there was just something they danced around. Ha <laughs> ha, well, you know, they're very fond of each other, and the two wives would just sit there watching the uncle and nephew moon over each other. So they would just sit around and watch the two flirt. Basically. Mm -hmm. And when the visits to the uncle would inevitably have to end, her husband would spiral into despair and depression because he was leaving his favorite person. They, oh, my love. I yes. leave my love behind. Right. On their wedding night, she recalled that he apologized, saying, I hate it as much as you do, but we must do it if we want children. They ended up having not one but two children, so evidently her husband was able to hold his uncle loving nose and do his royal duty. Of the many things that Marie focused on, one of her core beliefs was that she was burdened by frigidity. Frigid or not, her list of lovers was extensive and varied, including the premier of France, as well as Rudolf Weinstein, who her son picked to be his psychoanalyst, despite the fact that he knew Rudolf was sleeping with his mother. A little complex there, very sticky. Mm. She also had a sexual attraction to her son, an attraction that was evidently reciprocated on both sides as she asked Freud if she and her son should pursue the attraction in order to help her achieve this holy grail of proper orgasms. Proper vaginal orgasms. Right, because no other orgasms count, which is why she's ever so frigid, because she's having orgasms, but they're not vaginals, so that makes her frigid. Right. Freud actually, to his credit, counseled against the incest, a vice that she followed. Thank God. And this should... I'm sure he said, oh, you know, it's just natural for, you know, the son want to fuck you. And I'm sure you, you, you just like the attention and you being a female wanting a penis. <laughs> any penis will do. I cannot counsel you to fuck your son to fix your frigidity. Her beliefs on her frigidity were based on the fact that she could not orgasm from penetration in the missionary position and any orgasm that was not a vaginal orgasm was not a real and true orgasm. Her quest for real true orgasms led to an ambitious measuring project that she was doubtless the only princess in the world to ever undertake. A measuring project, you may ask? What kind of measuring contest is this? In 1924, she published the results of her measuring contest under a pseudonym and she presented her theory of frigidity in a medical journal. She measured the distance between the clitoris and the vagina in 243 different women, and she concluded after analyzing their sexual history that the difference between these two organs was critical for the ability to reach orgasm. She was notorious in aristocratic circles as the measuring princess, well, how do you just meet these women and be like, hey, Can I oh, measure? Me. might I measure from your clit to your opening? Yes. Yes, that was her thing. And she managed to convince 243 women to lift skirt, drop trow, and let her measure the exact distance. Now, it would have to be very specific down to the centimeter. You know, you can't. She's got to get up in there and get very yeah. intimate. Yeah. Very few women would have ever had the privilege or position of power to be able to ask other women if they could measure their lady bits. But being a princess gave Marie more leeway than the average woman of the day. You there, scullery maid. <laughs> Let me see your vagina. <laughs> I need to see what you're working with for science. But that you would also have to have asked them, can you experience vaginal orgasms? Yeah, she would have to do the measure them down to the millimeter and do a backstory of their sexual history. Hmm. For science. It's good to be the queen or princess, <laughs> as it were. Her research identified women with a short distance who could reach orgasm easily during intercourse. Women with a distance of more than two and a half centimeters who had difficulties and women who were in between the two. She considered herself on the far end of women that had their clitoris too far away from the vaginal opening, and she ended up approaching Dr. Joseph Haliban to surgically move her clitoris closer to her vagina. And she actually had him experiment on 
corpses first to perfect this procedure. She hoped by moving her clitoris closer to her vaginal opening, she would finally be able to have the real, true orgasm that a woman is supposed to have. They teamed up to develop a surgery that severed the ligaments around the external clitoris and pulled it closer to the vaginal opening. She subjected herself to the surgery, but, surprise, surprise, she found herself still frigid, and she probably more than likely suffered scarring around her clitoris and a subsequent lack of sensitivity. The surgery was not successful, but she was not born a quitter, and she actually ended up subjecting herself to it a second time as well. Neither surgery had the intended effect. It turns out that slicing and dicing yourself so that you can have the proper orgasms, according to Freud, is not the most effective use of either your time or your genitalia. Despite her completely ineffective multiple surgeries, she remained committed to both psychoanalysts and Freud. She bailed out the psychoanalytic publishing house on several occasions, and she paid Freud's ransom to Nazi Germany, as well as buying the letters that Freud had written to William Fleiss about his use of cocaine <laughs> from Fleiss's widow when Freud could not afford the crafty widow's blackmail price. We're going to reference William Fleiss later in this podcast, and we will get back to the cocaine in a bit. Freud had wished to destroy the letters, but Marie refused, insisting that they were of historical importance. She did agree to never read them and was true to her word. The cocaine letters were not published until 1984. She was also instrumental in delaying the search of Freud's apartment by the Gestapo, and she arranged for Freud to smuggle abroad some of his savings hidden in a Greek diplomatic pouch. She persuaded a Nazi to sign the papers enabling Freud to leave Vienna and also arranged for the transport to London of his books, collection of antiques, and his analytic couch, which is a lot of work to do for someone that directly caused you to have two unnecessary surgeries to your clit. Yeah. One of the noteworthy things that I came across in doing the research for this podcast is that Freud had to have been a very charismatic man. People seemed to forgive him and hold very little ill will against him, despite some truly unpleasant encounters they had as a result of their interactions with him. Becoming a practicing psychoanalyst herself, Princess Marie would receive patients in her garden, and she would sit on a chair behind them and crochet while they lay on the couch and process their difficulties. She continued her practice up until her death of leukemia in 1962, despite her husband's wishes that she discontinue the practice. While many of her ideas have since been discredited, there is no doubt that Marie was an interesting and motivated woman who utilized her money, privilege, and position in ways that no other princess ever has before or since. After all, there was only one princess on the planet who ever came up with the idea of clitoral surgery and then put it into practice on her own self. Snip, snip. As we've seen, Freud had a very strange relationship with women. Mm -hmm. he yes. He saw them very much as a mystery. The great question that has never been answered and which I have not yet been able to answer, despite my 30 years of research into the feminine soul, what does a woman want? Pockets. I guess pockets and freedom? Yes. To be themselves? Yes. He also saw women as fairly useless. Women oppose change, receive passively, and add nothing of their own. Jesus. As we talked about before, because women don't have a penis, they can't form morality, right? Because they have no fear of being castrated. 
Right, right. That's what keeps me being immoral is because I don't worry about having my dick chopped off. Exactly. I'm glad that you finally accepted this fact. <laughs> Fuck you. Girls, therefore, must be guided through civilized life by their father and then as a woman by their husband. You can only gain morality by having a man direct you by his moral fear of castration. But the women that choose not to marry these lesbians remain loose cannons who are fundamentally untrustworthy and unstable. You can't trust those lesbians. If women were bad, lesbians were the worst possible kind of woman. <gasps> those shifty lesbians. The woman who refuses to see her sexual organs as mere wood chips designed to make the man's life more comfortable is in danger of becoming a lesbian, an active phallic woman, an intellectual virago with a fire of her own. The lesbian body is a particularly pernicious and depraved version of the female body in general. It is susceptible to autoeroticism, clitoral pleasure, and self-actualization. I refuse to see my genitals as mere wood chips. For the pleasure and comfort of a man. I guess that makes me a lesbian. Your genitals are mulch. Get used to it. <laughs> Nothing but mulch. <laughs> I will line my garden bed with your genitals. <laughs> Freud is wrong, wrong, wrong. <sighs> Don't have mulch genitals. Freud also saw lesbianism as a gateway to mental illness because it removes a woman from the chain of life and from daily guidance. By a man. Or oppression and control. Women were insane, but lesbians were the epitome of insanity. Lesbianism is always the fault of the woman's father, according to Freud. He either parented too distantly, giving a girl no one on whom to oedipally attach, i.e. develop adequate penis envy, so he wasn't there enough. He was too distant and the girl could not become fixated on his penis. Or he parented too closely and scared the child. Either way, it is the father's fault that a female becomes a lesbian. Wrong. He did believe that lesbianism was curable through psychoanalysis. Wrong again. He was one of the early believers in gay conversion. Wrong. When you consider all this together, I think it's incredibly odd that Freud's closest companion in his later years was his youngest daughter, Anna, who was a homosexual. Oh. <laughs> Plot twist. What is even stranger is that although Freud warned his disciples against psychoanalyzing family members because, as he saw it, the analytic relationship was an erotic relationship, which is full of transference and countertransference, he himself entered into intense psychoanalytic sessions of six nights a week with Anna, which totaled in over... A thousand hours of analysis. Six nights a week, he was elbow deep in his lesbian daughter's brain meat. Yep. That's a little incestuous. What did Freud and his daughter discuss? Sex. Well, yes, her compulsive masturbation <laughs> and homoerotic, masochistic masturbation fantasies. Naturally. Of course, of course. Hey, Dad, pull up a chair. Sit down. Let's talk. Okay. Anna Freud's masturbation fantasies were, I would say, kind of unique and quite in-depth. 
as she puts it. A medieval knight has been engaged in a long feud with a number of nobles who are in league against him. In the course of a battle, a 15-year-old noble youth is captured by the knight's henchmen. He's taken to the knight's castle where he's held prisoner for a long time. The knight threatens to put the prisoner on the rack to force him to betray his secrets. He nearly kills the youth through the long imprisonment, but just before it's too late, the knight has him nursed back to health. As soon as the prisoner has recovered, the knight threatens him again, but faced by the youth's fortitude, the knight spares him again. And every time the knight is just about to inflict great harm, he grants the youth one favor after another. According to Anna Freud, she would orgasm when thinking about the beatings that this young man was getting from this older knight. And of course, in this fantasy, she was this young captive man being held by this older fatherly man getting beaten. And this is what made her come. I wonder what Freud would have to say about that. Well... Hmm. I don't think that it's a far stretch to see how the themes of these fantasies can be applied to the process of psychoanalysis itself. So this young nobleman is put on a rack, <clears throat> a couch, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and made to reveal his darkest secrets by this older fatherly figure. Mm. But sometimes a cigar is just a cigar, right? Right, of course, right. No connection. But if you think about it, it's this weird feedback loop where she's basically describing the psychoanalytic process of being tortured, made to give up your deepest, darkest secrets, and that's her masturbation fantasies, which then lead back into psychoanalysis, which lead back into masturbation fantasies. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. <sighs> You might think that a father spending hours each night grilling his daughter about her masturbation fantasies in an attempt to help her with her compulsive masturbation and possibly guide her towards a heterosexual relationship is a little odd. I do. I, yes, I do. As a matter of fact, I think that's a little odd. Well, I don't know if everybody else would agree with you, but <laughs> sure, I could see how that might be considered a little odd. But it takes an even stranger dimension... When you learn that her father gave lectures on these fantasies at conferences while the daughter sat silently beside him on the stage. I didn't think it could get stranger, and it just did. But to Freud's credit, he never did disclose that these were Anna's fantasies when discussing them in public. He probably got off on discussing her fantasies in public, but not letting anyone know it was his lesbian daughter's fantasies that he was... He's such a pervert. It's just... It gets... It gets weirder how okay think about this hold this all in your mind and also consider that shortly after ending these sessions with his daughter in 1925 he published his elaboration on penis envy where he essentially says that the moment a girl first discovers her lack of a penis it is an incurable psychic trauma from wrong. that single moment on wrong the girl will want a penis wrong as she matures she will realize that she can never grow one hoping then for second best she will begin to desire her father's penis because she knows that incest is taboo the girl's desire for her father's penis will be wrapped in shame this begs the question, how much time was devoted on talking about Anna's desire for his penis? If he is, in fact, the father and developing these penis envy concepts and really elaborating after all these intense sessions with her, how often it was like, okay, honey, tell me about your desire for my dick. Uh, where does my dick fit into all this, my dear? Uh, where does your dick fit in? Oh, Oh, that's so, uh, it's so icky. That's icky, man. Oof. So let's recap. <laughs> okay, yeah, let's recap. I, let's... He's intensely psychoanalyzing his own daughter, which he is himself claimed is a very erotic relationship. 
during these psychoanalytic sessions, she is describing these masturbation fantasies where she is being held captive and forced to give up her secrets by this older man. And he is elaborating on his own theories that young daughters fixate and crave their father's penis. Well, that's just a big ball of awkward. I wonder what holidays were like at the Freud house. Awkward and full of cocaine and cigars. That actually sounds kind of like a party. (laughs) Unfortunately, despite all this intense psychoanalysis, Freud failed to cure his daughter of her compulsive masturbation, her masochistic fantasies, or her lesbian tendencies. Oh, shocker. So he claims that it can be cured through psychoanalysis, yet even under the most scrutinizing psychoanalysis imaginable, it is n- does nothing for his Six daughter. days a week with the most detailed you could get with supposedly the best in the game, and he failed to make any progress. It's almost like you can't stop someone from being a lesbian or being a masochist. What? I know, right? Obviously, you just didn't put enough time or effort. You could maybe get someone to masturbate less, but masochism and lesbianism are pretty deeply ingrained character traits. Good luck with getting those out by laying someone on the couch long enough. Anna continued to masturbate and, in fact, used this same fantasy for the rest of her life. As she put it in a letter to her close friend, I'm impressed by how unchangeable and forceful and alluring such a daydream is, even when it has been like my poor one pulled apart, analyzed, published, and in every way mishandled and mistreated. I know that it is really shameful, but it is very beautiful. Additionally to continually using this masturbation fantasy for the rest of her life, Anna also entered into a 54-year-long relationship with Dorothy Burlingham, who was coincidentally the heir to the Tiffany fortune, so they were pretty well off. But she had daddy issues. Oh, boy, did she have daddy issues. <laughs> hey, everyone. This is Rain DeGray. If you want to keep tabs on me and check out all the cool stuff I'm doing, you can head on over to my website, raindegray.com. And while you're there, sign up for my newsletter so that you and I can stay in touch. And if you are on Twitter, check me out at either Rain DeGray or the Dirty Talk cast. Dirty Talk podcast has a new Twitter. Just search Twitter for Dirty Talk Podcast or add us at Dirty Talk Cast. Oot. If one woman undergoing surgery that was not only unnecessary, but quite possibly made things worse can be attributed to Freud, how about two women? Two is always better than one. Uh, not in this case. In this particular study, it's not just quite possibly, but guaranteed. The surgery that went down had a devastating effect, resulting in permanent disfigurement and leaving the patient a partial invalid until she died of a cerebral hemorrhage. You've piqued my curiosity. Emma Eckerson was an Austrian author. She was, for a while one of Freud's most important patients, and for a short period of time became a psychoanalyst herself. She has been described as the first woman analyst who became both colleague and patient for Freud. When she was 27, she went to Freud seeking treatment for vague symptoms, including stomach ailments, depression, and issues related to menstruation. Freud diagnosed her as suffering from hysteria and, shocker, believed that she masturbated to excess. To be fair, he thought most people masturbated to excess, including his own daughter. It seems like a running theme. Too much masturbation? Stop spanking the monkey. I think he felt that masturbation was fine in men, but since it was a masculine activity, women should not be engaging in it. Because their genitals are just supposed to be wood chips for the comfort of men. Mm -hmm. Her treatment lasted around three years, and it was one of the most 
protracted and detailed of his early cases. For all that she was so close to Freud, he abandoned her like a hot potato when things went wrong. And did they ever go wrong? Cocaine is a hell of a drug. While Freud was in full nose candy phase, he ended up becoming close pals with Wilhelm Fleiss, an ear, nose, and throat specialist who also possibly was doing things with his son. Their correspondence is full of Freud's nasal trouble, how much cocaine he was snorting, and how frequently pus was flowing out of his nose. This was the same correspondence that Fleiss's widow later held hostage, and Princess Marie had to pay a lot of money to get the letters back. Fleiss had developed theories that included the belief that sexual problems were linked to the nose by a supposed nasogenital connection. <clears throat> ah, yes, the legendary nasogenital collection slided up my snout, baby. That's right. You give oh, me such good nostril. So deep. Fleiss had been treating nasal reflex neurosis by cauterizing the inside of the nose under local anesthesia. He conjectured that if temporary cauterization was useful, surgery would yield more permanent results. He began operating on the noses of patients he had diagnosed with the disorder, which is where Emma entered the picture. The obvious treatment for her stomach ailments, depression, and excessive masturbation was to have her nose operated on. That'll fix things. Freud and Fleiss teamed up to perform the surgery, a surgery that Freud admitted he felt medically unprepared for. Fleiss did the actual surgery, and Freud was his assistant. They cauterized Emma's nose with cocaine, which was legal at the time, and occasionally used as a local anesthetic. And after shoveling grams of pure cocaine up her snout, they bandaged her and sent her on her way. Two weeks later she returned to Freud because of ceaseless nosebleeds and her operated-on nose not healing. I'm going to let a letter that Freud wrote to Fleiss tell the story. I wrote to you that the swelling and the hemorrhages would not stop and that suddenly a fetid odor set in and that there was an obstacle upon irrigation I asked Rosannis to meet me. We did so at noon. There still was moderate bleeding from the nose and the mouth. The fetid odor was very bad. Rosannis cleaned the area surrounding the opening, removed some stickier blood clots, and suddenly he pulled at something like a thread kept on pulling, and before either one of us had time to think, at least half a meter of galls had been removed from the cavity. The next moment came a flood of blood. The patient turned white, her eyes bulged, and she had no pulse. Immediately thereafter, however, he again packed the cavity with fresh gauze, and the hemorrhage stopped. It lasted about half a minute, but this was enough to make the poor creature, who, by then we had lying flat, unrecognizable. At the moment the foreign body came out, and everything became clear to me. Immediately after which I was confronted by the sight of the patient, I felt sick. <sighs> after she had been packed, I fled to the next room, drank a bottle of water, and felt miserable. <sighs> Rosannis stayed with the patient until I arrived to have both of them taken to Lao Sanatorium. Nothing further happened that evening. The following day, that is, yesterday, Thursday, the operation was repeated and the bone was broken wide open, the packing removed and the wound curated. 
there was scarcely any bleeding. Since then, she has been out of danger, naturally very pale, and miserable with fresh pain and swelling. She had not lost consciousness during the mass of hemorrhage. When I returned to the room, somewhat shaky, she greeted me with the condescending remark, So this is the strong sex. Emma never truly recovered and was left permanently disfigured until it was probably an untimely death due to the unnecessary surgery. Freud ultimately reasserted his full confidence in Fleiss's competence, making Emma responsible for the whole catastrophe by concluding that her post-operative hemorrhages were wish bleedings caused by her hysterical longing for the affection of others. Wish bleedings? Right. The reason she couldn't stop hemorrhaging and bleeding all over the place was because she wanted affection from others, Freud in specific, and not because she had a botched and completely unnecessary nasal surgery done by two coked-up dudes and she had half a meter of gauze left in her head for half a month. No, 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 no. That Trixie woman was making herself bleed for attention. Mm. Women are conniving. Such drama queens. Ugh. I know the path to knowledge is a jagged one, not a smooth one, and there are many detours and missteps along the way. But my biggest takeaway here is that cocaine is not going to give you any particularly powerful insight and that personal responsibility is a thing. Freud could have used a little bit more personal responsibility and a little less white powder in his life. <laughs> I can just imagine these two coke-addled guys sitting in a room. What are we going to do? I don't know. She's horny. She's masturbating. <laughs> Let's cut up her nose. All right. Let's do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That'll fix everything. <laughs> Obviously, her nose is attached to her junk. Well, the nasogenital connection, baby, everyone knows about that. That's what we have for you this time around. Thanks for joining us once again for the Dirty Talk podcast. We hope that you enjoyed our deep dive into the mm. odd, bizarre life. Weird, weird Sigmund. world of Freud. Again, we have more. It's hard to believe, but there so much is more. more. So much. And we will be doing an After Hours podcast follow-up like we do for all our regular podcasts. If you haven't already, you can follow us on Patreon at the Dirty Talk Podcast. And you can get the bonus episodes, the follow-up episodes, our weekly Dirty Talk After, after hours. hours. Before we go, we do want to share our podcast challenge, which is... The three R's. Recommend, rate, and review. Yes. If you like the podcast, go tell your friends about it. We highly appreciate it. Go review it wherever you get the podcast and rate it. We appreciate your five-star ratings. We do. It honestly helps other people find it and support what we're doing because we love having a big audience. Bigger is better, right? Not always. Uh, Freud would uh, probably disagree with you. Freud was wrong about many things. <sighs> I don't know. Wrong. I don't know. I think these women should still get these nasal surgeries after... Right. <laughs> getting tons of coke packed into their nose. <laughs> I'm sure stranger things happened in the 70s. <laughs> True. There's probably some cocaine in someone's nose, and before you know it, there was something else in their nose. Wow, that's just... <laughs> he was just a man ahead of his time. <laughs> Speaking of places you can find the Dirty Talk podcast, it is available on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, Tune in radio, basically everywhere you can think of to find a podcast, and also on our YouTube channel. Just look for Dirty Talk Podcast on YouTube and you will find it there. The last thing we want to do is thank our honorary producers, 
you can follow us on Patreon. And for a certain level of monetary contribution, you too can become an honorary producer of this podcast. We thank you very much. We send you fun, cool stuff. And you get mentioned at the end of every podcast. Our current honorary producers are... Rolf Hansen and his wives and yes. the kids. And yeah, the new kids. Right. So congratulations, Rolf. It's been a while now. I guess the kid is probably a couple months old. I think he might have more than one, too. I don't know. He's a busy man. So thank you very much, Rolf, wives, and childrens. We do really appreciate your support, and we love having you all part of our Dirty Talk podcast community. Yes, we do. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Over and out, jaunty salute, being fired off, here we go. Jaunty. Bye.